and I won't make you stand through it all. We'll be reading from Genesis, the opening passage of, of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1 through uh, chapter 2, verse 3. This is the word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, or probably appropriately sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens that separate, to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God said, and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms, swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it... God rested from all his work that he had done 
in creation. It's the word of God. May he add his blessing to it, to our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we give you praise and thanks for this opening passage of your word, this beginning uh, of, of our treasured book, your word, the Bible. We thank you for it. We pray that as we consider it over the next few weeks, uh, we pray that you would, through your spirit, guide us, give us clarity. And most of all, Lord, help us to understand and to live by what we find here because we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to uh, begin, since this is sort of a, uh, uh, well, it's obviously not sort of, it's the beginning of the Bible, and it's the beginning of the story of, 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 of the Bible, which goes from all the way from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. And so what I want to do is I want to show a video that sort of gives us in, in uh, five minutes the whole story of the Bible. Uh, and, uh, of course, not all the details, obviously, but uh, just the overarching story, the overarching theme of the Bible, the union of heaven and earth, God's space and our space. So go ahead and run that video. Thank you. 
this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being the temple, he's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so, so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited by animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading, spreading, and reuniting more and more heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is, what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus? Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap. So in the Bible, the idea of heaven. There was a start over right there. So that's sort of the major theme, the, the, the meta theme of the whole Bible, uh, bringing together, bringing heaven and earth together as it was in the creation. Genesis 1 uh, and first few verses of 3 stand alone as a kind of prologue to all of that. Uh, so it's the prologue to the whole Bible. It's the prologue to to uh, the redemption story where God is, is, is gathering for himself a people from every tribe and tongue uh, and nation. And uh, it's, it's the story of the reunion of heaven and earth. It's, it's also the prologue to what we call the, the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis to Deuteronomy. It's also the prologue of Genesis 1 through 11, which is what we're going to do for a while here, uh, the primeval history. Uh, Genesis 1, verse 1 could be several sermons all by itself. In fact, I, I know that through history there have been those who have made that either one very long sermon or several uh, smaller sermons. And I'm not going to do that, but I do want to point out a few things that we can glean from just that first verse, and especially as it's related to, uh, to the other verses and, and, and one little issue that has come up in how we understand it. Uh, so, uh, note, first of all, the implication of verse 1, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God already was. He already existed in the beginning. He is the I am. He is the preexistent one. God is infinite. He's outside of, of and, and he's above time and space. In reference to time, we say that, that he's eternal. He has no beginning and no end. In reference to space, we say that God is omnipresent, that he's fully present everywhere. And it's kind of weird to use the word uh, everywhere because that's a spatial term, but he's above Space. God does not have size. He's does, he doesn't have spatial dimensions. He's present fully, completely in all of his nature at every point of space and also outside, outside space, whatever that means. So, uh, right there in that verse, we already see God as, as the eternally existent one present everywhere. One amazing and comforting impl implication of this for us and for the people that were listening originally and everybody since, is that God has time for you. God has time for you. He has undistracted, fully attentive time for you all the time. He, he's never distracted. He's fully present with you all the time. All of his attention, all of his presence is with you all the time. All of his being is present with you. He's not torn away. He's not distracted. God, it's, it's never right to say, God, you must be busy with so many other things. How can you take time for me? That is not a, a problem for God. All his being all his, is present with you all the time, forever and ever, even at times when you're distracted, you're, or, or I'm unaware, God is with me. God is with you. He's fully present. He's watching over you fully with his most patient, uh, merciful, gracious, and compassionate and loving godness, fatherhood. 
That ought to comfort us. That ought to reassure us. May the Holy Spirit help us to understand right from the very beginning that that's who God is to us. And if God is for us, who could be against us? Well, back to Genesis 1, verse 1. Uh, This verse has stirred up a lot of controversy through the centuries, starting at least back in 1100 with a a man named Rabbi Rashi. Uh, He began to ask questions about the translation of this verse, as we understood sort of the traditional translation, which most of us uh, understand. And basically, how you interpret that function of uh, 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 verse 1 is, affects how it functions, how it, how it defines how God created. Did he create out of nothing, or did he take what was already there and just form it? That's what was at stake. And that's what this, uh, in 1100, this guy began to ask that question, and it became a real issue uh, for in about the last 100 years. I don't think there was a huge, a bunch of debate, but, it, but it's become more of an issue these days. And what's in view here uh, is, first of all, let me just say this. Both of the views have God ordering all, all, all of creation, all of the chaos. He brings order to it. But the controversy surrounds in verse 1 with how, how you translate the Hebrew there. It's, uh, if it, if it's, is it to be translated like we have in the Revised Standard Bible? Maybe you've got one of those where it says, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and all that, okay? In the beginning, when God, there's, there's this temporal word slipped in, slipped in there, and that might be a legitimate way to translate it. But then what happens is the material that's present in verse 2 is said to already exist because it's in the beginning when, when God started creating, ordering, that stuff was already there. And that was the view of this rabbi, and that's a view of that when you see the RSV, that's how they translate it. Uh, on the other hand, if, if verse 1 is sort of a main clause describing the first act of creation, and then verse 2 picks up some of how that, how that uh, plays out, then what you've got is God creating out of nothing, and that's your traditional view. That's what all of our most, probably our most popular Bible versions have. They, they say, in the beginning, not when God created, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and so he started from nothing, created that, and then he took that, which was formless and void, and he ordered it. So the traditional view is that God created everything out of nothing. And that's the perspective that, that I believe, and that's the perspective that I take. And, and it's well attested, I think, through the rest of the Bible in places like the Psalms and in John 1, for instance, Colossians uh, 1, 16, where it says uh, he, is, uh, he, 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 he created everything visible and invisible, um, Hebrews 11, where it says, uh, by faith we believe that God created all everything that is, uh, whether visible or invisible, he created it by his word. Uh, Revelation 4.11 says, worthy are you, O Lord, to, uh, and God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. See, the testament of scripture seems to me to say that he created out of nothing. There was nothing, and then he spoke, and it became something. So let's take a look at that material that he created. It starts in verse 2 there. Uh, even though uh, creation out of nothing is implied in, in verse 1, uh, what's the theme of the, of the whole passage is not that he created out of nothing. It's that he took that, that, which he created, which was chaotic, and he began to order it. So these subsequent acts of creation were God bringing order to chaos. Uh, So in verse 2, we see that the earth is, uh, in Hebrew, tohu vabohu. Uh, Tohu vabohu means formless and void. And this introduces into the narrative here a conflict, a conflict. There's suddenly, there's chaos. If, if, If it's formless and void and there's darkness and there's deep waters, the original hearers would have heard that and said, this is utterly out of control. It is utterly chaotic. It is dangerous. It is fearful. All of those things are metaphors for, for complete, out-of-control chaos. And it would fuel their anxiety and their fear. As uh, If we could really grasp what that feeling is, we would feel that as well. But there's hope already introduced right at the beginning for, because it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face 
of the waters. The Spirit of God is there. He's not in it. He's not mixed in with the chaos. He's over it, and he's about to do something. He's about to do something. So, so we hear that, and, and, and we can maybe resonate a little bit with those early hearers thinking, this, this, is, this is scary. This, this darkness, this depth, this, it's, it's scary stuff. And we can kind of feel the anxiety taking over, but then we hear the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the water, and we, and we realize that their lives and our lives are not left to the cyclonic winds of chance. So verse 3 through 31 covers the creation uh, in six days. And God takes right away the darkness and the chaos of creation, and he orders it from chaos to cosmos. What is cosmos? Well, cosmos in the dictionary means the world or universe regarded as an orderly, harmonious system. So it goes from disorder and disharmony, in, in fact, hostility, to order and, 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 and peace. God takes it to that, to that place. God orders the chaos. He fashions the creation into chaos and, and into this orderly and harmonious and beautiful work of art. He's the, he's the premier artist in, in doing that. Well, God's first word then uh, on the first day is, let there be light. What does that do? Immediately, that darkness that we all fear, that made us tremble, has been scattered. Let there be light, and there was light. And then next, God deals with, the next day, God deals with the waters. It says he, on the second day of creation, he separates them the, into above the expanse and below the expanse. The expanse, as we should probably understand it, is the sky. And so there's, there's clouds and water up here, and there's, there's water all over the earth. Okay, And then it says he deals with the water on the earth. He causes the waters to gather together, and dry land appears. And so we begin to see this order, and we begin to, with the people, these ancients go, okay, this is good. Because, see, they were used to creation stories where, where the gods were, were, were just basically doing things to people sort of haphazardly, just didn't even care about people. And God, the true God in his creation, is, is doing this to prepare a place for that fellowship with us, for that relationship with us. And so he gathers the waters together and forms dry land. And verse 10 says, God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. So the darkness and deep waters obey God's command. Chaos is brought under his control. And we've learned that God has everything, everything under control. And the good news is he has every, all the minutiae of our lives under his control, bringing order into our chaos. And, we think we, and, that, and that ought to move us to thank God. So God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, are active in creation. Uh, we learn more about the, the, the Son's involvement in, in the New Testament uh, when it says that he was, uh, like we read earlier, uh, he is uh, through, him, through Jesus... God created the whole world, and he was involved in, in, in creation of everything. Uh, and we know, as we look at this, that God has created in such a way that he hasn't left anything to, to the whims of, of chance, of chaos. Everything is under his governance. Every, every detail is under his watch care. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole universe but there's more going on here than just creating in this, in this opening passage. Uh, this chapter is an argument. It's an, a, a polemic against the foreign gods that the Israelites were running into. And when they were wandering in the wilderness and coming to the nations, when they came to the, to the promised land and all the gods of the pagans there, and even much later, uh, actually, as they thought about going back to Egypt, they would have heard these stories and, and known that those gods were, that were threats to them uh, were not the true God. And then much later, when they were sent into exile into Babylon, this again would have really resonated with them. All the way to our day, where, where when we're under pressure, when we're under stress, when chaos seems to be reigning in our lives, we're tempted to, to find ways, uh, little idols, to try to remedy it. And, and so, for instance... Uh, uh, 
when the Israelites were encountering the Egyptians, who they were under oppression for 400 years, uh, God attacks, or this word attacks uh, and, and, and just kind of brushes aside the Egyptian gods, the sun god, Ra, and, and the moon god, Khonsu, just brushes them aside when he says, uh, in, he, when he talks about the greater light and the lesser light, he doesn't even give them names. He doesn't give them names because he doesn't, first of all, want them to, to kind of think in terms of idolatry, but also because he wants them to know, hey, they're just in the line of creation. The sun and the moon, they're not anything. They're just part of God's creation. In fact, they come after the plants. You know, they're just in line. So they're, they're, they're nameless here to avoid them having some sort of power or influence over the people. God, uh, the, Moses, who wrote this, is saying, you know what, they're nothing. They're just created beings. They're not gods. In fact, what this is saying is that God is the king. God is the king of the universe. God is the king of the earth. God's kingdom has come to the earth. Now, scholars tell us that the, the idea, when you get to, to Matthew and, and the Gospels, the idea of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God uh, on earth is not an idea that you find uh, explicitly stated in the Old Testament. It's not very prevalent. But if this is true, that the Chapter 1 of Genesis is saying that God is the king. He created it all. He's the king over it all, and he's in it. He becomes a part of it. He walks in the garden, which we'll see later on with the people. Then the kingdom of God has come. And so that, that video is kind of showing that. The kingdom was here, and then there was a break. And God, the story of the Bible is, is the kingdom of heaven and the, king, and, and the earth coming back together. And by Revelation, the end of Revelation, that they're back together. So God is the king of the universe, and that's what we see throughout the Bible. Um, so what does that mean for us? If, if this is true, in the midst of all of our stress and anxiety and fear, and, and fears come, don't they? I mean, fear and anxiety is a reality of life. There is, there's, there's no overcoming those things. There, there's no doing away with them once and for all. Those things come. And so we hear these words uh, in, in Genesis 1, and we go, but, but God has brought order to the chaos. He brings order to my chaos. When we're tempted to seek relief in some other way besides our confidence, 